Hey everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Got a great show for you tonight before we dive in. Say hello, let me know where you're tuning in from. Don't be a stranger and don't be shy. If you've got questions, go ahead and start pumping those into the feed. We usually run out of time and can't get them all answered. So, you know, first come, first serve is the way we typically handle it. So if you've got them, make sure you type them in. Tonight's show, we're going to be talking all about asthma and allergies. We're approaching cold and flu season. We're approaching that seasonal change. And so allergies and asthma are a big, big part of what we're going to see increase. Now, many of you also might be um, curious or wondering about that, that cold and flu season and there may be some overlap with COVID. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that too, whether or not you should be concerned. So let's dive in. We're going to, again, talk about allergies, the immune system, and asthma. So let's just talk a little bit about some asthma facts here. Number one, we've got 25 million. Now, these are U.S. numbers, so if you're tuning in from somewhere else in the world, you know, your numbers might vary from country to country. These are in the United States. But 25 million people in the U.S. suffer from asthma, which results in, check this out, 10 million annual visits to the doctor's office. That's a lot of money. Um, that's a lot of resources being used up for this, right? We've got symptoms of asthma. You know, most people know coughing, wheezing, tightening of the chest, fatigue, anxiousness. Sometimes this one is not talked about, that anxiousness. So if you struggle with anxiety or being anxious a lot, it could be because your airways are inflamed and you're getting reduced oxygen. Reduced oxygen can happen for a number of different reasons, um, but... In asthma, obviously, you're not getting adequate oxygen into the lung fields, uh, but some people also have it with different kinds of anemias, and that's why I bring it up, because if you're gluten sensitive or if you have an issue with gluten, this is a very common cause of iron deficiency anemia, and so that also leads to the symptom here, okay, of anxiousness or anxiety, and the difficulty talking uh, as well. So these are, again, some of your more common symptoms of asthma. We've got 1.6 million trips to the emergency room out of these $10 million, or 10, not dollar, but 10 million annual doctor's visits. And then again, a total cost of $56 billion annually. And then we've got this big one right here. So the incidence, this is, this is big because the numbers are climbing dramatically. The incidence is rapidly increasing. Just in the past five years or so, the cases of asthma have gone from, from uh, they've gone up by about 5 million. So from 20 million to 25 million, just in the, in the past few years, we see that increase. We also know this. So why do we see that increase over the past few years? There's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of reasons why. We're going to talk and get into some of those reasons. But this is a big one right here. We see there's a correlated, corollary curve between obesity, the rise in obesity, as well as the rise in asthma. And we know at this point, it's, it's approximately 45% of, of the U.S. population is obese. And more than half, almost actually, I think it's the last numbers, were 60% of the population is overweight. Now, the difference between being overweight and obese is, is more weight, right? Uh, but obesity is even more dangerous. So it increases the risk for the development of asthma, the two go hand in hand. So, and I, when I say asthma, let me back up just a minute. What I also want you to be thinking about here, because people don't realize is asthma is an immune response. And so when we're talking about seasonal allergies, food allergies, um, those types of things, this is an immune response that creates an inflammatory issue in the airway. And there are different mechanisms behind that immune response. But, um, you, if you're developing asthma and your doctor hasn't really looked at you and what you might be reactive to, whether it be food allergies or whether it be food sensitivities or whether it be outdoor environmental allergens, things of that nature that you might be able to filter, it's a big, big key component because, and here's why, if you have asthma, okay, then you're using your immune system and you're weakening your immune system. You're using your immune system for the lungs, but you're weakening your immune system to fight everything else. And what that does is that it puts you at an increased risk for infection. It puts you at an increased risk 
for more aggressive seasonal allergies. So increased risk for bacterial, viral, et cetera, infections, but also an increased risk for allergy response. And this is why it's important to connect the two. Allergies and asthma go hand in hand because they're both intrinsically related with your immune system. So let's talk about some of the common triggers of asthma. So I want to take you kind of through a journey, a lifestyle journey here. So one of the first things that happens to people um, in high, if you're, you know, again, if your children were born in a hospital, a lot of times, and a lot of doctors are doing this nowadays, they're doing these cesarean, these scheduled cesareans where, you know, the wife um, and the husband get with the OBGYN, get with the doc, and they schedule the birth date of the baby. In essence, it's planned. That cesarean is planned. And so the problem with the cesarean birth, and I'm not saying if you've had a cesarean birth that you're a bad or an evil person, so don't take this the wrong way. Um, but a cesarean birth reduces the initial exposure to the vaginal flora. So remember that the baby is exposed to flora through the vaginal canal. So if we bypass the vaginal canal, the baby's first exposure to flora is the hospital air. Now, what's the problem with hospital air? The problem with hospital air is it's full of what are called nosocomial bacteria. These are antibiotic resistant bacteria that can, are, have been actually been shown, there have been a number of research studies showing that cesarean babies are more prone to allergies and asthma as a result of lacking the vaginal flora exposure upon birth. Now there's something that you can talk with your doctor about. There's actually a, a, a type of therapy that can be done and that's where they take a cloth and they, they absorb the vaginal membrane and juices and things and they swab the baby's face. So they're calling that vaginal swabbing. So they swab the inside of the mouth and the face after the baby comes out cesarean and that way they're colonizing the baby with a microflora from the mother's vaginal fluids and liquids. And that helps to set the stage for a healthy microbiome. Now think about this. We talk about autoimmune disease all the time. We talk about one of the primary or predominant triggers for autoimmunity. And remember, asthma is an autoimmune problem. But the, one of the primary drivers or triggers is the leaky gut. So if we're giving birth to children who aren't getting exposure to healthy microbiomes, then they don't initially get great colonization, right? And that's important for their immune function, for their immune system to develop. So we want the babies, okay, to get that exposure. So if you have an emergency C-section or, you know, this is part of childhood planning. When you're talking to your doctor, when you're talking to your husband or wife, this is part of what you want to plan for. If, an, if a C-section has to happen in an emergency scenario, vaginal swabbing can be something that can be very, very helpful for your baby. So talk about it ahead of time in case it has to happen. But, if you're in, but again, if you're having a vaginal birth, you don't have to worry about, about this. Another one is lack of breastfeeding. So again, we look at stage one here, right? Stage one, babies are born with a disadvantage of getting flora. Stage two, lack of breastfeeding. Now, Many women are choosing to breastfeed more and more and more, but a lot don't. A lot of women work. They've got to go to work. Now, again, this is not me saying if you didn't breastfeed your child that you're a terrible parent. I just want to educate you, and I want you to understand how important this is. A lot of your formulas, the primary ingredient is high fructose corn syrup or sugar, right? So when you're talking about feeding your baby, and I want you to all do me a favor. Any of you who know a mom, who know new parents, right? Make them read the back of the label of the formula, the ingredients. And what you're going to find, usually the second or third ingredient, is corn syrup, right? It's one of the predominant ingredients today, or sugar of, of another variety. But corn syrup is the most common one used with most formulas. So basically what you're getting, genetic, genetically modified corn syrup extraction with synthetic vitamins and some protein added in. This is what many, many formulas are made out of. They make them super sweet. So you're basically feeding your baby sugar water with protein and synthetic vitamins as a primary substrate of fuel, as, as their primary source in the diet. It's terrible, right? We don't wanna start babies off with pure fructose corn syrup as, as, a, as a something that's supposed to nourish them. So again, we know that sugar plays a role in inciting inflammation. And what are we talking about here? We're talking about airway inflammation. That's what asthma is. It's a form of autoimmune-induced airway inflammation. So we don't want 
cesarean, if you're going to, if you have to have a cesarean vaginal swabbing, number two, if you're not going to breastfeed your child, really proofread those formulas and make sure you pick the absolute best one. Um, there's some companies coming out with newer formulas that don't contain all this corn syrup and GMO uh, based ingredients. And that would be a good idea to investigate. But if you're buying kind of your standard run of the mill formulas in the grocery store, you're basically feeding your baby sugar water um, with synthetic proteins and vitamins in it. And that's not good. Number three, as life goes on, so baby's born cesarean, then if it's, they're not breastfed, they're fed sugar water, right, for two or three years. And then they're introduced to the plethora of processed foods, the dyes, the artificial flavors, the food additives, the pesticides, preservatives. All of these things we know can burden the immune system. It's not that maybe any one of these things completely destroys a person's health, but it's the conglomeration of the multitudes, the thousands of different chemical processing agents that are found in all these processed foods that we're rearing our children on. So our children, again, cesarean birth, poor feeding if we're not breastfeeding, and then when we introduce them to food, the foods are so highly processed to contain up to, there's, I think at last check, there was a, a approximately 3,000 different forms of chemicals found in processed food that the government approves and basically tells you there's no harm or that they're safe. Not true. We know that there's in, in biochemistry, there's something called the law of synergism. That is when you add multiple chemicals together, th then they can have a synergistic impact or synergistic effect. It's kind of like, um, I don't know if you guys remember this, but it was maybe 15, 20 years ago, college athletes and high school football players were popping aspirin and they were mixing it with caffeine and ephedra. And so this, this triple combination of three uh, basically drugs that are stimulants, when you add all three together, it's not one plus one plus one, it's one times 10 times 10. And so the effect was far greater. And so some athletes were pushing their hearts so hard and then going out on the football field and, and several people died because that was a popular supplement stack. So that synergistic effect of multiple chemicals working together. Well, remember with processed food, we have up to 10 or up to 3000 different foods that are working together. So no safety data on all of these chemical complexes being added together. Okay, so again, this kind of one, two, three, this is what our children are exposed to. And then when you, you know, when you add in, there's another element we really could add in. Let's, let's make a little room here. Uh, and that's, we'll call it up here, we'll put it up here, number four, that's screen time. A lot of these babies, the parents are putting iPads in their hands, parents are putting devices in their hands, and so they're being bombarded um, with indoor time. In essence, they're basically being trained to become addicted to computers and to technology, and so what this has actually been shown to do is this reduces outdoor activity. Now, why is that important? When we reduce act outdoor activity, we reduce our exposure to microbes. We reduce our exposure to sunshine. We reduce our overall physical stature. And so with that, we get kids that are muscle atrophied right? They're not active. And when you're not active, remember what, why is it important to be physically active is one of the reasons why is your muscles are a pumping mechanism for your lymphatic system. This is how your body drains and detoxifies. So if you're physically inactive, if we're teaching these kids to stay on computer screens and not have physical activity, we're basically with all these toxins we're pumping into them, we're not giving them the physical capacity to detox from them. But then when we take away microbes, and we take away sunshine, we know that vitamin D deficiency is one of the triggers for asthma. Okay, we talk about nutritional deficiencies. We got it right here. We'll get to that in just a minute. So vitamin D deficiency from lack of sunshine, but then reduction in exposure to microbes over time. Well, why is that important? Because bacteria are important. There's a, a field of medicine um, that we, we've all probably heard of this, this, this theory called uh, the germ theory of disease, right? The germ theory, meaning that the germs, move this over a little bit more. Germs, we've all heard it, cause disease. This is partially true and partially untrue. Germs don't really cause disease. It's more like 
host imbalance. What is what do I mean by host? Host is you. You are the host. Your body is the host. Host imbalance and really immune balance. Host immune imbalance is what actually causes the disease. The germ can be a kind of a contributing factor. And, and here's what I mean by that. If I took a thousand babies and swabbed their throats, and we would find, inevitably, we would find staph, we would find strep in these children. But in the vast majority of these babies, if we, we could take a thousand healthy babies, we wouldn't we wouldn't see an infection, even though the bacteria that sets the stage for the infection would be present. So again, the germ itself, the presence of the germ doesn't dictate or guarantee the presence of the illness or the disease. Remember, germs take advantage of a weakened host immune system. And so again, we don't necessarily blame the germs. And this, this right here, host imbalance, this is referred to in science as terrain theory. So germ theory versus terrain theory. Terrain means the, the terrain of the health of your body is more important than whether or not a germ is present. Okay, and we also have another very compelling theory in medicine that's making headway. It's called the hygiene hypothesis, meaning that humans today are too clean. If you're too clean, if you live in an environment that's sterile and too clean, um, let me give you, a, you know, we always talk about your body works on this premise of use it or lose it. So when your body doesn't ever get trained to fight external microbes and allergens and things of that nature, your immune system never gets trained. It never actually gets to exercise. So just like your body's not exercising, right, your physical stature when you don't go outside, if you're living in this really hyperhygienic environment, your immune system also atrophies. It gets weak as a result of not being exposed. And so what we're learning is that the cleaner people are, the more they tend to develop autoimmune disease. The dirtier people are, the more they tend to develop infection. So there's this kind of, think of it as almost like a scale. If we're too clean, it increases our risk for autoimmune disease. If we're too dirty, it increases our risk for infectious disease. Now, in life, it, it always really boils back down to balance. So if we look, look at this as, as a scale, or you remember the teeter-totter when you were a little kid and you had you know, Johnny on one end and, and Billy on the other end, right? And so they're sitting on that teeter-totter. Forgive my art, I'm a terrible artist. It wasn't my accelerating point in school. Uh, but these kids are on this teeter-totter. And, and so think of these kids as, as the right balance between dirty and clean. Okay, so they both wash their hands. They both get outside and play. Neither one of them are in super sterile environments. There's just that right balance. Then there's a balance when they get on that teeter-totter. They're, they're going to be able to have a good time. But if there's an imbalance, let's say that Billy over here is 50 pounds overweight. And what's going to happen is little Johnny on the other side is gonna have his feet dangling, right? So we're gonna have a, 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 a kid that's got their feet dangling off. That's imbalance, right? And so this kid's gonna really, really struggle. Um, so again, it's a balance between clean, it's a balance between dirty. And so what we're finding out is that you, if, you, if you wash too much, you can actually overdo it and you can increase the risk or the prevalence for autoimmune development. I mean, understand this, infectious disease at the turn of the 19th century, so in the early 1900s, one of the biggest causes of mortality and death was infection, was disease. But what happened? Historically, what happened, let's, let's make some room here. Historically, what happened is we started to, the government started to develop systems to clean the water to check the food. So we, we had, basically we had checks and balance systems to make sure that we weren't getting exposure to dirty water or to dirty food. But even more importantly, one of the biggest impacts was indoor plumbing. Indoor plumbing, it was these changes that led to the hygiene revolution. And it took infectious, so, so at the turn of the 1900, at the 19th century, so infectious disease was way up here. Okay, and by 1943, we're doing a diagram of a 
what had happened was infections did this. And they became almost non-existent. And by the way, this is before the first vaccine. So I know a lot of people give vaccines credit for the, for the demise of infectious disease, but actually it was hygiene and it was plumbing. Now this is a great thing. And so I'm saying this because many of you heard me say that too much hygiene can be a bad thing. Well, here's what we've also seen happen. So if we kind of go over, let's move this over just a little bit too. If we follow this out to today, Here's what we've seen, and if this end of the curve, if this is autoimmune disease, here's what we've seen. We've seen autoimmune diseases do this. So we've got like this inverse correlation between being too clean or too dirty. And so too clean um, leads to autoimmune disease, but it's not just being too clean. It's being too clean, but also being exposed to the uh, array and the battery of chemicals, processed food, uh, multitudes of chemicals, etc., in the diet. And then over here, it was bacteria and germs. So again, there's this balance, right? We want to kind of be somewhere in the middle. We don't necessarily want epidemic levels of autoimmunity, but we also don't want epidemic levels of infectious disease. So what's the real answer here? The real answer is to meet it in the middle. Um, and what do I mean by meet it in the middle? You, you, you have to look at hand washing as an example. I've, I've seen some parents that want their kids to wash their hands 10, 15 times a day. I've actually had kids brought into my office. Their hands were loaded up with atopic inflammation because they washed so much. They scrubbed the oils completely off their skin. And so what that did is it basically it destroyed the health of their skin too clean. They were doing it too much. You can do it too much. You can go overboard. Um, same thing with showers, people taking two showers a day, three showers a day. I have uh, people that have come see me and their, their skin is inflamed and it's because they're bathing in water that's got chlorine and chloramines and bromine and other chemicals in it and fluoride in it. Um, and, and, and they're doing that in the name of thinking that they're cleaner. You can go too far. Remember that there's a microbiome, not just in your gut, but there's a microbiome on your skin. You've got micro, you've got bacteria teeming on your skin. And these bacteria are your friends. They're helping you produce uh, agents that help your immune system work and that help your immune system in your skin see and view the outside world and protect your skin from that outside world. And if you cleanse it every single day, you're, you're doing it too much. My advice for most people, I mean, unless you're just working a filthy type of job where you're working like on a farm with hogs and you're scooping hay and you've got hog poop or, or cow poop all over you, like take a shower, wash up. But if you work a desk job in a hyper hygienic environment, there's no need to shower two or three times a day. So you really, you know, you kind of want to, you want to regulate how clean you are based on how dirty your occupation makes you. Okay. So we'll get, let's move on to nutritional deficiencies. So vitamins, minerals are an essential part of immune regulation. Essential meaning you, your body, your body can't survive without vitamins and minerals. That's what essential means, right? And so we look at, for example, with asthma and allergies, vitamin C and vitamin D deficiency are more common in those with asthma and allergy symptoms. And we'll talk, we'll talk more about that too in a minute. And then we got food allergies. We know that food reactions can create systemic inflammation. And so what I was saying earlier, what I was talking about earlier is that if your immune system is fighting food, so fighting all those chemicals, right, that you're being exposed to, then it has less, let's just call them resources, it has less overall resources to fight the environment. And the reason I say that is because most people that have asthma, uh, when, they, when they get their diagnosis, most of the time it's you're allergic to cedar or ragweed or mold or pollen, oak pollen or whatever it might be, or you know, dander, dust, cockroaches, whatever it might be, animals. But really, they're not, they're not really so allergic that they would have asthma if they would change this part right here. So like if they would if, if doctors, if, if immune doctors and asthma doctors would look at these two pieces right here, then what would happen is the child's immune system wouldn't be so overwhelmed by all the chemicals or overwhelmed by, by foods that they may be reactive to that there would be resources left over to fight the environment. So if our immune system, again, if it's so overwhelmed that it doesn't have 
enough resource to fight the dander, the pollen, the mold, the external, right? Then what ends up happening is when those things come in in, in an overwhelmed lung, um, it's going to create inflammation and you're not going to have the immune power to deal with it. So this is a very common scenario that I see. We also have, so aside from food allergy, we also have gluten sensitivity. Now, what, here's what we know. Those with celiac disease have been shown to have a higher risk of developing asthma. Okay. And so this effect may be due to gluten induced vitamin deficiency. Actually, some really good research has found that we, we, we believe that a lot of asthma develops in people with gluten issues, celiac, because of this right here, because of this reduction in vitamin D. I also speculate that zinc plays a major role in this process too. Zinc's very important for the barrier function of your lungs. And so we see the top deficiencies in people with gluten issues, um, iron, vitamin B12, vitamin D, and zinc are really probably the big top four on that list. And you see zinc and, and uh, again, zinc and vitamin, vitamin D, we know that gluten sensitivity issues can create that through the damage to the intestinal lining. Now, aside from food, we talked about food chemicals, food allergies, and gluten sensitivity. I want to bring up something else because there's some really interesting research. I talked about this in my book, No Grain, No Pain, but if you haven't read it, um, one of the oldest known forms of asthma is called Baker's asthma. And this was actually given as a delineation for bakers, right? Bakers, not baker as in a person's name, but bakers as in people who made bread and made cake, right? And they were throwing the wheat flour and it was, as they were working with the flour, it would aerosolize and they would breathe it into their lungs. And this was a very, very common cause of asthma because wheat activates an inflammatory response in the lungs for many people. And so again, it's not even necessarily that you had to eat it. You were just being exposed to it. I've actually had clients that have come to see me who were bakers, who owned bakeries and had severe asthma as a result of being wheat allergic or being gluten sensitive. And so something to, to kind of keep in mind uh, if you have an issue with gluten or if you, if you have asthma of, of an unknown or undisclosed reason and nobody's measured you for gluten, that could very well be one of the reasons why. Now we go on from there to you know some of the other factors, poor air quality. Now, I, I think it was the EPA that published a paper recently um, on indoor air being 100 to 200 times more polluted than outdoor air because the way homes are being built today. The seals on the doors and windows are super tight and super energy efficient. And so a lot of the chemicals that are used in home building, uh, a lot of these volatile organic compounds that are used in paints, that are used in varnishes, that are used in carpets and upholsteries are basically they're outgassing into the home, but they have nowhere to go. So that poor air quality plays a major role. This comes also back to living in a hyper hygienic environment where you're worried about germs, but not worried about chemicals. Think about this for a minute. How many people right now are spraying chemicals all over their bodies, their faces, their hands, their workspaces in the name of safety, right? In the name, in, in these chemicals are anti-life chemicals. And many of you, when you're indoor air quality, you're living in that. And then you're also lathering yourself up in that over the fear for a virus. Again, that, that exposure to germs versus that hyperhygienic chemical exposure, those two things have to be balanced out. So poor air quality is a major one. We've got air quality issues outdoors too. Those of you right now in California with the wildfires certainly are probably struggling in a big way with air quality right now. So what can we do here? Probably one of the best things you can do to, to accommodate air quality in the home is let your house air out. So if you're buying a new home, if you've bought a new home recently and you can smell that new paint or that new carpet, open the windows, create a cross draft, let mother nature come in and say hello. There's a law in biology called the law of passive diffusion. What that means is that a, a substance will travel from the area of greatest concentration to the area of least concentration. So if you've got, if these are the walls of your home, and you've got all these little chemicals concentrating and not being able to escape. If you open a window, that law of passive diffusion says that these chemicals are going to disperse to the area outside where there's a lower concentration of these chemicals. That's called passive diffusion. So these chemicals will, will basically, you, Mother Nature will basically dilute them for you. So open that house up, get a cross draft, especially if you open the front and the back windows. You get a nice breeze going through the home. You're going to get a lot of that outgassing 
out of your home, which is very, very important. You're not going to be able to build a home that's totally green that has no chemicals. It doesn't exist. And even a lot of the chemicals they're using in green building today, we're going to find in 10 years or 15 or 20 years that they're not all that good for us is what we thought. So that's that's always the case. It's all It happens every year we learn of a new chemical we thought was safe actually wasn't. You're not going to be able to build a home without chemicals, so you've got to air it out. The other thing I would recommend is ultrafine HEPA. And there are different kinds of devices. And if you're interested in the one that we recommend personally, you can visit glutenfreesociety.org. You can go there, visit the shop. And then there's a section on lifestyle. Um, and there's an air filter that we recommend that, that is an ultrafine HEPA. So it picks up all these chemicals, right? And it pulls them out of your air and helps keep your air clean. I actually, I have one at my house. I have one in my office because I want to keep my air, personal air clean as well. Then we have environmental allergens. I mentioned this earlier. So again, if your body, I said before, I said if your immune system is so busy fighting food and chemicals, it doesn't have the resources left to deal with things like ragweed, pollen, cedar, mold, and other outdoor allergens. And so these things, we know a person can definitely be allergic to them. I mean, if you've lived in anywhere in the, in the hill country in Texas, there's something called cedar fever that's very common. But not everybody gets it. And one of the reasons not everybody gets it is because some people have really strong and good, healthy immune systems. And so these things don't bother them as much. So again, the stronger you can make your immune system, the less prone you are to developing allergies and asthma. This is actually is something we absolutely know we're sure of. So then we have infections. We know that like viral and bacterial infections, especially if we're talking about asthma in the lung and in the airway, we know that these things can trigger inflammation in the lungs, making it harder because you get fluid accumulation and fluid buildup with that inflammation uh, in the lungs, making it harder to get that oxygen delivered. So remember what I said earlier, I said that this reduces immunity. Processed foods reduces immunity. Nutritional deficiencies reduces immunity. Food allergies increase the burden on your immune system. And all these together, right, including that gluten, that poor air quality, increase your risk for developing those infections. And so in my experience anyway, generally, these things come after the fact. These things, when kids have asthma or adults have asthma, they tend to get frequent infections, not because the infections are causing the asthma, but because the weakened immune system that's led to the asthma has put them at an increased risk for developing the infection, and so they're more prone to it. We see this a lot, too, in people with a strong, strong history of antibiotic use. Why? Because antibiotics wipe out the flora. So if you're, if you're on an antibiotic, okay, you got to keep that in mind. That's like, it's not like having a cesarean birth, but you're knocking out your natural flora in your gut. They don't come without risk. Now, if you've got a major infection, you... You might die from take you know follow your doctor's orders take that antibiotic but some doctors dispense antibiotics like candy especially in kids oh you got a little sniffle here's an antibiotic oh you have a sinus issue here's an antibiotic like they hand it out without any without any kind of explanation of the long-term consequences on the immune system but chronic antibiotic use can destroy your good gut bacteria and that can lead to an increase for risk for infection including one of the types of infections i didn't list it here but fungal infections are, are a very, very common issue. And I, I know there was a study published, I think it was the American Journal of Medicine um, on, it was, the study was actually geographically here in the Houston area. And what they were finding is the most common cause of airway issues and sinus issues was actually not viral or bacterial, but it was actually fungal. And so this is one of those things, if you've got a strong history of antibiotic use, one of the side effects of long-term antibiotic use is, is yeast overgrowth and yeast and fungus. This is a fungal infection, right? So you've got to, you know, have that conversation with your doctor. Don't just take the antibiotics like candy. Um, it's one thing if your life is being threatened by the potential for an infection. It's another thing if, um, if, if you're just taking it just in case, which again, that's a lot of the scenario that I see. Now, something else that we want to talk about is medications. There are a lot of different medications that have been shown to increase asthma symptoms. And so many of you may not be aware, but NSAIDs, NSAIDs, that stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. It's drugs like ibuprofen and naproxen, okay, Celebrex, those are NSAIDs. And then drugs like beta blockers, these are medications for blood pressure, and ACE inhibitors, also medications for blood pressure. They've all been shown to increase asthma symptoms. So if you're on these medications, 
and you're having trouble breathing, if, if you, since you got on those medications, you've been having more trouble breathing, you're developing symptoms that you think might be asthma, and your heart doctor or your prescribing doctor is like, oh, let's send you to the lung doctor, stop there before you do that and have a conversation with that doctor about the potential for these beta blockers and these ACE inhibitors that are being used to lower your blood pressure to affect and impact your asthmatic symptoms. Because if you don't, you might be going to the lung doctor and the next thing they're going to put you on and is an inhaler with steroids. And steroid inhalers weaken the immune system. And what have we been talking about all night? We've been talking about the immune system being a playing a critical part in your body's ability to protect itself from an asthma response. Now, here's what we know. It's kind of an extenuation of diet. This image is from the journal Nutrients. It's published not very long ago, 2017. But what we're looking at here, let's put that in the middle, is we're looking at, again, you can see on this side, a diet rich in plant-based fruits and vegetables. Now, that doesn't mean that, it, that you, you know a lot of vegetarians out there would say, well, don't eat meat because it's not good for you. This, is, this, this study actually was examining the Mediterranean diet, which includes meat. But what they found is that the nutrients, the, this, the antioxidant nutrients from fruits and vegetables and some of the other things, that's what this little green triangle here is. You see, so you see up here in this diagram, that little green triangle, this feeds your healthy bacteria in such a way that you get metabolites called short chain fatty acids. These short chain fatty acids, so when you feed your good bacteria and you, you produce short chain fatty acids, these help seal the gut, okay? So this lining right here, we want that lining to be sealed. We don't want it to be leaking, right? We don't want things to penetrate through because if things penetrate through, you know, you've all heard that term, leaky gut. This is leaky barrier. Well, fruits and vegetables provide Sort, certain types of nutrients that help your bacteria produce short-chain fatty acids. Short-chain fatty acids do what? They fuel your cells of your intestines to be strong and to replicate and turn over. So it helps keep that gut nice and tightly sealed so that, again, you don't have a bunch of bacterial byproducts or other chemicals leaking into the bloodstream. Okay. Whereas on this side of the equation, I mean, we got this Western diet. Okay, and so we got these chemicals and all these processed dyes and sugar and everything else that are coming in. Okay, so these things here, and then you can see that what they do is they affect the bacteria to produce inflammatory mediators. So you can see here in this diagram, you can see interleukin-6, that IL-6, that's a chemical that causes inflammation. TNF-alpha, that's tumor necrosis factor alpha. It's another chemical that causes inflammation, interleukin-8. So what happens is when you eat that Western diet, it promotes bacteria to promote the production of these chemicals. You remember, your bacteria is trying to help you, defend you from the garbage that you're eating. And in so doing, you're producing immune responses to try to neutralize those terrible chemicals. Well, what happens in the airways? The same thing. So whereas this is the bloodstream and this is the gut, on either side, these are the barriers in your lung. And a lot of people don't realize that your airways, okay, your airways have the same kind of barrier. See how you got a single layer, a single barrier here? That single barrier, we don't want your lungs leaking either. So researchers found that leaky lung is a real potential issue when you have the wrong diet. And I like that little hamburger they drew in this. So again, that, you know, that reminds me of one of those old, if you grew up when I did, those old uh, Barbie dolls. My sister had one and it had the, the little mini hamburger. You guys remember those? It looks like that little mini hamburger. Anyway, side note. So leaky lung, which would create the same kind of scenario here where we would get the chemical inflammatory mediators being produced as a result of feeding bacteria properly and breaking a, a hole in that barrier. So we know that there is a dietary effect on asthma, and any doctor who tells you differently doesn't read literature and doesn't pay attention to diet and probably hasn't studied diet, and so probably is not real super qualified to even talk about whether or not diet plays a role. Um, I always say, you know, if you're going to be a doctor and you're going to be an expert and you're going to talk about how something can or can't affect it, you should be an expert in what you're talking about. And nutrition, there are very few nutritional experts in the world uh, with the title doctor behind their name. So... Uh, but there are some really, really good ones. 
So anytime you're, you're, you're taking nutritional advice, my, my point is when you're taking nutritional advice from a doctor, make sure that doctor you're taking that advice from has nutritional background training and not just the meager seven or less hours that they get in medical school where they learn that nutrition is not really all that important. Um, so again, moving on here, this is another diagram. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about excessive airway mucus because this is a big problem. So we make mucus. Okay, why do we make mucus? Mucus is protective. It's a coating. If you've ever eaten a food and you make a lot of mucus, what your body is doing, your immune system is naturally doing is it's producing more mucus to lay down as a barrier to protect you from something in, in what you just ate. So it's a protective coating, but inside that protective coating, you also produce something called SIGA. Now that stands for secretory immunoglobulin A. It's an antibody and it's your first line of defense. So it's your first line of protection along with that mucus. And so I wanted to talk about some things that we know can increase excessive airway mucus. Because one of the things that happens with excessive mucus is if we know what's triggering it, we can potentially remove the trigger, right? Um, because, because we don't want to drown in our own snot, so to speak, and we don't want to flood all that fluid into our lung base. So one of the things that creates excessive airway mucus is viral infection, bacterial infection, what's missing from this diagram that we talked about a moment ago, fungal infection can also do it. Oxidative stress, what does that mean? You ever heard of the term free radicals? One of the things we really haven't talked about much is smoking. We talked about air quality, but we really didn't talk about smoking. We all know this should be a no-brainer. Smoking increases the risk for the development of airway damage and inflammation and oxidative stress. And hopefully none of you watching this show are at least smoking no better than to do something that detrimental and damaging. But one of the reasons why smokers have such a hard time in their lungs and breathing is because they're creating oxidative stress through the production of free radicals caused by the chemicals in the garbage in cigarette smoke, right? So that leads to mucus because why? Why are we making the mucus? We're, your body is smart. It's making the mucus to protect you from what you're doing or to protect you from things that could be potentially very dangerous. And so this is why sometimes when a person gets a cold or a flu and, <clears throat> excuse me, and they get the sniffles and they get kind of the mucus, it's because their body is naturally trying to respond by laying down more protection. And so one of the things that some people do is they take medications to suppress mucus formation. And that, in my opinion, is a very bad idea. Anytime you take medicines to symptomatically suppress your symptoms when your body is trying to help you, you could actually create a problem instead. So again, these are big ways that excess airway mucus, a stress, inflammatory, reactions, viral, bacterial, fungal infections, the wrong foods. Let's talk about some of the foods that we know can also lead to excessive mucus production. Now, this is not an inclusive list, but these are some of the top foods that we know can exacerbate or increase mucus production. And at the top of the list is dairy. Okay. And probably I should have put grains as number two and eggs as number three, but Dairy is a big one. Dairy is a very, very big muco or mucogenic producing food. Eggs can, can also cause you to produce mucus. Grains, bananas, potatoes, soy products, sugar, and alcoholic beverages. Now, one of the things you'll know, or you'll kind of, aside from the eggs, you know, kind of everything else on this list, it is high in sugar. Okay. And sugar is one of those things, the more carbohydrate, the more sugar, if you overdo it, can create a lot of these mucus-based problems. So if you're struggling, uh, if you're struggling with your asthma issue and you can't figure out and you produce a lot of mucus and you're still struggling and you've changed your diet, but you're eating some of these, you know, not the dairy, the grain, but some of these other foods, you might just consider looking at these and try removing them to see if you don't notice any improvements or any difference, but these are, you know, these can be big, uh, big mucogenic based foods. Now let's talk about some nutritional strategies around this. And I want to talk tonight, I want to talk about nutrition strategies around 
um, what you can do, like what kind of action steps, aside from changing your diet, aside from eating organic, aside from getting sunshine and exercise. So we know those things, right? So we can, we can exercise, we can get sun, we can eat organic. Okay. We can ask our doc to test for food allergies. Okay, we can filter our air, we can filter our water. We can make sure that we're getting adequate sleep. Like these are all things that are, you know, tried and true. We know these things are going to support your immune system and they're going to help your immune system function. Okay. But let's talk about some supplemental strategies, some things you can do nutritionally supplementally that'll also support this. So if you're struggling and you're trying to get out of this, one of my favorite things to use in this regard is something called, let's make some room here, is something called NAC, NAC. Now, if you've heard me talk about NAC, actually, I think NAC is so important. I did a whole show on it and you can go back if you haven't seen that and watch that archive. But NAC stands for N-acetylcysteine, okay, cysteine. And it's an amino acid and it has mucolytic properties. And so one of the things that many doctors do is they prescribe N-acetylcysteine for people who have excessive mucus production. And what it helps to do is it helps break the mucus up and it helps them drain, okay? And if you're having, if you've got a cold or a flu or you're struggling with seasonal allergies, you'll find that a lot of like natural support, natural allergy support formulas this is one of the main ingredients in them, in acetylcysteine and this is the reason why, is it acts as a very potent um, mucolytic. And so it can be very, very effective. So it's one of my favorite. Another one is nettle. Nettle's also very good. It, it, it helps with the immune response. It helps support the, a normalized type of re immune response when you're facing all these allergens because sometimes what happens when you're, if, if you have a true outdoor allergy, and let's say you're eating beautifully, you're eating perfectly, and your allergies are basically gone, but one time of the year, maybe you're just so allergic to ragweed or so allergic to cedar or whatever it might be that you still have reactions. This is where this strategy can, can be very supportive is, is, again, the knack, the nettle, the vitamin C, and the quercetin. What's interesting about this combination this is a very similar combination to what doctors and hospitals are now recommending for COVID. If you've looked at some of the some of the major hospitals are now putting their COVID patients on vitamin C and quercetin. They're also putting in there, and I would add this to the list, zinc, and they're also using vitamin A. Why? Zinc and vitamin A are super important for lungs and lung replication and lung tissue. They're also zinc is a very powerful antioxidant. And, and so it helps as an antioxidant in the lung fields. Vitamin A is necessary for cellular turnover in the lungs. So it's very important that you have adequate vitamin A. Quercetin helps push zinc into the cell. So quercetin is what we call a zinc ionophore, meaning it opens up the, the cell's uh, pores and allows zinc to get deeper into the cell. And the reason why they're using that for COVID is because it, is it increases, remember zinc, reduces viral production and replication in four different mechanisms in four different ways. And that's why doctors are making that recommendation. But again, quercetin helps zinc get into your cell. This is quercetin is kind of think of it as a natural, it kind of works similar to hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine is a, is a pharmaceutical zinc ionophore. It opens up your cells to zinc. Quercetin is a natural zinc ionophore. It opens up your cells to zinc. Vitamin C is very, very critical for that free radical damage. So I, we, what we talked about a minute ago, back over here, we said that, you know, one of the issues in the lung uh, happens right here where we've got increases in oxidative stress. So this is where like that vitamin C can be very helpful. Zinc can also be helpful right here as well. Um, so again, nutritionally, those are very, in my opinion, very critical, very important nutrients to help support the lung fields and to help support your immune system especially during allergy season. Now, one of my favorite formulations is something called Histocyst. If you struggle with, with chronic seasonal allergies, uh, Hist Histocyst um, has a combination of multiple different nutrients in it. 
and it's designed to help support the immune system so it's not uh, hyper reactive uh, to those environmental allergens. Remember, one of the symptoms, one of the things that happens when you're reacting to the environmental allergens is your body produces an antibody called IgE, and that IgE, that IgE produces histamine, and histamine is what causes the watery, teary, itchy eyes, runny nose, coughing, itching, sneezing, all those types of symptoms that we typically associate with asthma and outdoor allergies. And so pistasis, we use to support the immune system so that the, the IgE doesn't cause as much histamine release. So it kind of helps to stabilize the immune cells that release um, that release histamine. And so that's part of why we, we call it histasis because it helps assist in regulation uh, and proper regulation of histamine uh, excretion. So a lot of you also, I've, I've, we've got a ton of questions about the hist low histamines in the diet or high histamines in the diet. Um, this would also be something I might recommend for those individuals who are reacting to histamines in their food or histamines in their diet. Because sometimes what happens, a person is histamine intolerant and so then they're exposed to all these environmental allergens and they're also eating high histamine food. And so the histamine food is high in histamine and then the allergens are creating a histamine release. And now their body is just being overburdened with histamine. And so instead of reaching for like Benadryl or Singulair, one of these over the counters that uh, have immune suppressing side effects can make you super sleepy and drowsy, um, natural, natural immune support can sometimes you know, can sometimes assist you in that, in that regard. So those are some of my favorite. So all that being said, I think let's open it up for any questions that are coming through tonight. Um, so yeah, James says, when the weather turns cool in the fall, my nose starts running. Well, there, th some people's nose run with the temper with a big temperature change. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's an immune response or an immune problem, Jane. Um, you know, it's, it's very common actually for cold weather to create runny noses. Um, Rajit wants to know, can I talk about mold and sinuses and what to do about in a future talk? Oh, surely I can. Actually, Rajit, I also have a, um, a five part series on mold. You might check it out. It's on our, it's on our, um, on our video blog on gluten-free society. How do you contain candida die off? I'm not sure I understand your question. When you eat sweet or rice, uh, if you eat sweet or rice, that's not candida die off. That's feeding yeast. If you're trying to kill off candida, you wouldn't want to eat sweet things or rice. So maybe rephrase your question and I can give you a better answer. Okay. I love this question. It doesn't really, I mean, so Tracy wants to know, she says she's 66. She's um, got COVID. Um, or not that she's got COVID, but with COVID still present, meaning that a lot of people are concerned right now about COVID. Should I get a flu shot this year? I love that question. And here's why. Um, here's what we know. There's some, been some great studies that show that the people with so greater problems with COVID as a rule, as a whole, happen to those who get flu shots. There were some major studies published. One of them was a military study, and they found that the people that had the flu shot were actually more susceptible to COVID. So if you're concerned and you have a real concern about COVID, definitely want to talk to your doctor about those research studies and about whether or not that's the right move. Look, I would also say, you can go back and watch some of my past videos on should you get a flu shot. But these guys are only effective 40 to 50% of the time, but they have the potential for side effects. So you have to also ask yourself, do you want that risk benefit? Is that risk benefit worth it to you? Is, is the risk of the potential for side effects from a flu vaccine worth a 40 to 50% benefit, especially when a lot of people that get a flu vaccine, especially some of these attenuated shots where there's a partial live virus where they end up getting the flu. And so when actually, when I worked, I worked actually, I was, a, I was interning through a family practice. And so it was everybody that I saw getting the flu shot were the most common ones that would come back two to three weeks later. 
and they had the flu. So, um, you know, I know a lot of doctors will tell you that flu shots don't cause the flu, but my experience and many other people's experience would speak otherwise. So I would just say you got you to gotta weigh it there. But I mean, if you're, if you're concerned with COVID, yeah, you need to know that the influenza shot and the studies that we know of actually increases the risk of that COVID issue. Um, let's see. A lot of non-questions there. So, a yield wants to know any advice on how to improve adrenal burnout or over uh, or overworked adrenal glands and constipation. Yeah, I did an entire show on that. A yield. If you want to go back and look at our archives, we've got a whole show on overcoming adrenal fatigue. I don't. We don't really have time to address that in any great uh, in any great way right now. Let's see, Marie says, hi, doc. What can be done to support asthma that is triggered by laughing and asthma that occurs while sleeping? I'd say if you're triggering asthma by laughing, I've not ever heard of that before. So that's not something that, uh, that I could really speak from experience on. I mean, I, I would say if you've got it, you I mean, if you've got asthma and laughing is a trigger, um, yeah, that's, that's different. I maybe look at whether or not you're having diaphragmatic spasms, but, uh, and that could be part of that laughing and that trigger. Uh, what was the other part of that question? Can you scroll up for me again? Yeah, on there. Yeah, right there. There we go. Uh, an asthma that occurs while sleeping. If it's occurring while sleeping, I would consider that there might be something in your bedroom that, that actually is irritating or inflammatory to your airways. I've seen cases where people develop asthma at night when they go to bed because they had mold in their bedroom or they didn't change the sheets or their pillowcase enough. And so bacteria and other things would accumulate on their pillowcase and create symptomatic response. So just make sure that that's not happening for you. So Linda wants to know how to lower a systemic high histamine level in somebody with the MTHFR polymorphism. Well, there's, just because you have an MTHFR polymorphism doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have high histamine. That So much of the information around genetics is so overblown. Like people, you have to understand you've got your genes, but you've got you know, 10 times as many bacterial, viral, and fungus also living inside of you. And they all have genes too. And so when you have this human polymorphism, you have to understand that people are putting way too much effort and credit into how your genes can impact you. And it has to more to do not with the mutation of your gene, but the environment that you put your genes in. And so MTHFR doesn't, even if you have a homozygous mutation, where, where both of your gene SNPs are mutated and, you, and that gene functions less efficiently, then the answer to that is not necessarily uh, anything beyond keeping your environment super clean. In essence, methylation is important for detoxification, but it's not really going to be a major, major factor in your ability to regulate histamine. Uh, let's see here. Both my husband and I have asthma. Our third baby had VB and is breastfed and I'm constantly fighting eczema has, oh, and I'm constantly fighting uh, eczema. He's red and puffy in the face all day, every day. I have eliminated the top eight food allergies and I'm going on month four of the diet and he's no better. He's supposed to start food in two weeks at six months and always make my own food. I'm not sure what I can do or what I should do. I Look, I would, you know, I would say, first things first, at that age, you really want to get them into an expert, Christy, um, and not mess around with it. Because when you start introducing food at that age and they're already having skin reactivity and, and eczema and atopic dermatitis and problems like that, you don't want to introduce anything that could create much bigger flares or problems. So I definitely would get with an expert. It can be a tricky situation with a youngster, but get with an expert to get a little bit better clarity. Okay, let's scroll down a little bit on both sides there. Um, what's the best way to rebuild the terrain of your gut? I'm grain-free, organic, organic, and vegan. Scroll that one down on the left for me just a little bit. That, oh, too far, right there. Um, and avoiding all food sensitivities, but still reacting to food and have major ragweed allergies. So one of the things you said, Tiffany, 
is that you're vegan. And you know, what pops into my mind is whether or not you might be getting adequate protein. Remember that protein builds your antibodies. And if you're struggling to rebuild your gut, you need that protein to strengthen the immune system in the gut. So I would, I would ensure that you're getting adequate protein. A lot of times when people have a leaky gut and they're trying to recover, it, think about your protein need is higher than if you were healthy, perfectly healthy, and you didn't have, um, and you, and you, so if you're perfectly healthy and you didn't have an increased need for protein for healing and repair, um, you could get by with a lot less protein. But, and this is where vegans sometimes get in trouble when they're trying to heal and repair, they're just not getting enough. So think of it kind of a simple formula is to take your body weight in pounds, and divide that by two. And so whatever that number is, so if you weigh 100 pounds, divide that by two, that's 50. You want to get at least 50 grams of protein, complete protein in your diet each day. And make start with that. Make sure you're getting adequate protein in because that could be one of the kind of the weak links in your chain. So Melody says, how do I know when you are live? I just scrolled down to this and is the only way I knew. Please help me with this. So the way you know that I'm live is you subscribe to my email list. You go over to glutenfreesociety.org and uh, you sign up for our newsletter. And so we always send out a notification about an hour to two hours before we go live. And that way you don't ever miss the opportunity to ask questions, Melody. Thanks for asking. Uh, let's see. Recommended dose of vitamin A for an adult and teen. Depends on whether or not you're deficient. If you're just talking about basic vitamin A, uh, for just uh, support, um, you know, it can range based on your age and based on your, on your weight, et cetera. But I would say if you're talking about a therapeutic amount, vitamin A, anywhere between, really between 5,000 and 50,000 international units. But again, I wouldn't want to do that high, high therapeutic dose for uh, super long periods of time. And especially not if you're not getting, um, not getting your levels monitored to make sure you're not creating a problem. Uh, let's see. My mom was diagnosed late in life with asthma. Prior to that and continuing today, she's had a chronic cough. 10 years or more, no one has a clue how to help. Melanie, if your mom's not gluten-free or following no grain, no pain, that's the first and simplest explanation uh, or easy thing I can give you to do. Here's my experience with that. I had a chronic cough for years. I would lie in bed at night and I would cough for 30 minutes to an hour and no reason why I should be. I was in good shape. I was exercising. But when I went gluten-free, and this was almost 20 years ago, um, that cough completely dissipated and went away. I mean, it was gone literally overnight when I quit eating gluten and grains. So that would be what I would suggest that you ask your mom to look at first. Okay. What's, what do I recommend? Let's see. No, answered that one already. Uh, Whitney says, I recently developed an oral allergy to watermelon. My lips swelled, no difficulty breathing. Can oral allergies be eliminated? They can be, but, but you have to understand why an allergy develops in the first place. Most allergies develop because the immune system is compromised in some way. So the only way you can truly um, address allergies that develop is to first address your immune system with the right diet, the right lifestyle. And so that requires a little bit of investigation. Again, getting with a good functional medicine practitioner might help you understand specifically for you um, what you need to do beyond basic things. Uh, how should nettle be taken in natural form or in supplements? Um, if, you, if you take histocyst, you're going to get plenty of nettle therapeutically. That's what, that's what I would recommend that you do. You can take it in a natural form as well. It's just in a natural form. If you're trying to get a specific quantity, um, you, you know, you, you can't guarantee that. Um, let's see our quantity of the active ingredient, I should say. Um, take, do I recommend taking 5-HTP for sleep? Any risks? Um, I, I would ask a, a, bitter, a bigger question. Not necessarily, why are you wanting to take 5-hydroxytryptophan for sleep? Um, it helps you make melatonin, yes. If you're deficient in tryptophan, then maybe it, it might be helpful or beneficial. But I'd say before you just go taking things uh, that can help with your symptom, I'd ask a, a deeper question is, why are you not staying asleep? Why are you not getting deep sleep? Is there something else creating that? Now, 5-HTP can be the thing. You could be low in tryptophan, and that could be creating or triggering that. So in some cases, taking tryptophan or 5-HTP is a good idea. In other cases, it, it won't do much. 
Let's see here. Yeah, let's keep going on there. Okay. Um, same supplements. Okay, yeah. So answered that question already. Talked about NAC. Uh, what we really didn't talk about um, is we didn't talk about, because somebody's asking about nebulized glutathione. And so some people with asthma that are struggling to, to, to get symptomatic relief. Um, we, got, uh, we got somebody opening the door there. Sorry about that. Some people struggling to get symptomatic relief um, do really well on nebulized glutathione, but that's something that you have to get your doctor to prescribe. So you might just want to ask, you know, if, if, if that's something you want to pursue, talk with your, talk with your doctor because they'll have to prescribe it to you. It's a, again, it's taking it just like you can take a steroid through a nebulizer. You can take glutathione through a nebulizer as well. Okay. I think we're out of time. We've got, uh, yeah, we're well over time here tonight, but thanks for hanging out with me tonight on Monday and make sure you come back next Monday and hang out with me some more for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Look, if you've got show topic ideas, put them in the comments below or email me at glutenology at gmail.com. We want to make sure that we're taking care of your health needs, your natural health needs. And as always, make sure you share this information with as many people as you think it might be helpful with our goals to help save 100 million lives. And I can only do that if you help me share this information with as many people as possible. Again, I show up for you every Monday night, so show up for me by spreading and disseminating this to everyone who could benefit by it. So have a great week. We'll see you next Monday for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Take care. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is gonna allow us to remind you right before we go live, but it's also gonna allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long, and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell, so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much, and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.